and we will pray that the message today is, will be as profound for you as it has been for me over the last many months in preparation for it. There you go. Good job, man. We'll get more. All right. With everything that's going on in the world, Russia threatening nuclear war, with the lack of peace that seems to be prevalent in our culture, in our society, and around the world, with everything that's taking place in the world to bring division among people whose commonality ought to be in Christ, the message of the resurrection is essential. What 1 Corinthians tells us about the resurrection is that several things. Number one, it's true. For the Christian, that's, that's critical. We're not just talking about a spiritualized thought of he re resurrected in my heart, therefore I have this interesting experience that can't really be nailed down. No, the resurrection actually happened. The crucifixion actually happened. More historical evidence, as we'll talk about today, for that than just about anything else in all of human history from that time frame. The crucifixion happened. He was dead and buried, the scripture says, and there's evidence of that throughout history from those that aren't friends of Christians. Those that hated Christians were, were, were reporting on the empty tomb and the appearance of Christ before over 500 people at one time. Kind of interesting that no other mass hallucination has ever happened in all of human history where 500 people viewed the same thing at the same time. It is critical that we understand that what we come to celebrate today is true. That it is an essential of the Christian faith. In other words, if you don't believe in the resurrection, no matter what you're doing sitting here this morning, you're not a Christian. The, the resurrection and the understanding, the physical, bodily resurrection of Christ is essential to the Christian faith. And if that happened, I would just suggest to you something I'm going to suggest to you a little later as well. If that happened, it is the most important event in all of human history that has ever happened. And we come to celebrate an actual risen Lord that sits at the right hand of God and intercedes for us with the Father. And that when the enemy comes to bring accusations against old Dave, and he does, and he comes to the Father and he says, Did you see what Seaford did? Did you see what Seaford thought? Did you see that? And he's going to go, yes, but the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that makes all the difference. There are amazing evidences of God's love in the resurrection of Christ, and we're going to look at some of those this morning. Easter 2022. When we lived in Colorado, uh, Elva and I would go out on Mondays. That was our day off when I was a pastor there. And we had gotten a Jeep, and we went to visit ghost towns back in the Sierras and in the Rockies in Colorado. We'd take the Jeep up these Jeep trails that very few people had ever been up, and we would visit these old ghost towns. They were mining towns, and they were, it was just interesting to go in the old buildings and look, but one of the most interesting things that we did was visit the old cemeteries. You'd go and you'd see these graves from people that back in the early 1800s, I remember one we went to that we were, we were way back in the Sierras, and, and there was nobody else back there but us that day. And, and there was five little gravestones. There was two that were about 18 inches tall, and then there were three small ones right beside of it. And it had a man's name on the one, and it said, born such and such a date, died, and it gave the date. And then the one next to it, woman, obviously his wife, birthed on such and such a day, died on the same day. And then these three little tiny gravestones, children, five, three, and two, died on the same day. And on the last gravestone of the child, it said, died in an Indian raid. And I thought, 
Isn't it interesting? You see all this family history right here that we never think about, we never know about. We, never, we didn't know those people, but we felt a connection with them that day. But one of the most common things we saw in graveyards are these two epitaphs. R.I.P., rest in peace, and here lies, here lies so-and-so. Rest in peace and here lies. Well, the, the message of Christ is the empty tomb, and he's not there anymore. The message was this, why do you search for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. He has risen indeed. There is nobody in the grave. All religious leader, other religious leaders in the world, people come to their graves to do whatever they do at those graves to honor them. And you can go to the several different graves in Israel that claim to be the grave of Christ, but they're all empty. The body's not there. You can go to Red Square. Elba and I have been on Red Square. Lennon's body still lies in Red Square, and you can go through and look through the plexiglass and see the body of Lennon that's been meticulously crafted with wax over the years. But his body is still there. The body of Christ is not there because he has physically been raised from the dead. And if, I would just suggest to you this, if all of the enemies of Christ during the time of his life, death, burial, and resurrection wanted to, to do a disclaimer on Christianity, and they did, all they ever had to do was just produce the body of Christ. Say, there it is. And yet the body's not there. Why? Because he's risen. He appeared, as the scripture tells us, to many over those days that followed and made his appearance to them. So is the resurrection hard for you to believe? If we don't have an experience with anything, personally, that becomes hard to believe. It's hard for me to believe that, that people travel in space as fast as they do and they can get them back here, but I've had evidence of it in my lifetime. But I've never personally experienced that. I don't know that. But if nobody has ever experienced a particular thing, it becomes harder to believe. But I want to suggest something else to you today. God is totally a unique person of the Trinity. We, we, there is no other referent for God. There's nothing to compare him to. There's nothing we can have reference to that goes, this is sort of like God. God does things in his own way, and his resurrection if he speaks and the world comes into existence, the resurrection becomes less hard to believe. He speaks and everything comes, and science is now showing that this whole universe came out of literally no thing. There was no thing, and then there was everything. The Bible reported that long before science ever caught up to the, that fact it becomes a whole lot less hard to believe that God in control of everything, totally powerful, would raise his son and do it in a way that paid for our sins. The resurrection, so says the Ju Jesus seminar, which I would highly encourage you not to believe. The resurrection is a beautiful metaphor, they say. Jesus resurrected in the hearts and the minds of his followers. And certainly that may be true, but that's not the story. That's not the end of the story. That's not even the beginning of the story. It actually is a historical event that actually did happen. And if we don't understand that, then our understanding of who Christ is and what he came for and our understanding of our own faith is lost in everything. Hey, you want to take the children back, one of you? There we go. Thank you all. So it's more than a metaphor. Yet the, the Bible claims that it's not just a metaphor. The Bible claims that it's actually true. So if you say you believe what this says, 
then you've got to believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. And if you don't believe what it says, then you're, you may be inches away, but you're still away from being a Christ follower. You're still away from being a Christian. Because that is an essential of the faith. So, let's look at Corinth. I've shown you a picture of Corinth before, but I don't think I've shown you a picture of what it might have looked like in the time uh, of Paul. Here's what 1 Corinthians 15 says. The scriptures, God's word, tells us these facts. The thing I love about this text is that you get the gospel in a nutshell. It is, it's all pulled together into a very concise and precise thing. Paul is talking to the people in Corinth because there was some discussion about whether the resurrection had actually happened. And I don't know exactly, nobody knows exactly what was being talked about, but there, there, it's apparent from the writings of that time that Corinth was having a hard time clinging to the reality of the resurrection. So Paul writes to them, and he wants to put it in very succinct form, and he wants to tell them, this is an essential of the faith. Don't let go of it. Don't give it up. I know that in that culture in Corinth, it is very tempting just to give up the, the essentials of the faith and bring in the, the ways of the world, but he says you cannot do that. You must stand. In fact, that's a word he uses. You must stand on this truth. Here's what it says. For I deliver to you as of first importance. As I go through this, let me give you a little uh, grammar lesson from the Greek here. The word first can, in, in the Greek is given in two forms. One of them is like an order of event. You do this first, you do this second, you do this third, you do this fourth. That's not what this word is. Of first importance was saying this is the first and most important thing you must always keep first. You never must let this go. This is the first and it must always remain the, bed found, the foundation, the bedrock of your faith. Of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. In other words, when he died, the other texts in the scriptures say he became our sin. Not just that he, he carried him as a burden, but that our sin, all of our sins, were infused through every fiber of his being. And when he died, he died being our sin, paying the price for our sin. That's very different than just well, I, I put the sin on the lamb and I, I sacrificed the lamb. He became our sin. Of first important, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, several things I've already said to you. Number one, the resurrection Paul, Paul is claiming to the Corinthian church is true. It is essential. It is an essential of your faith. You must not let it go. It's of first importance. It's the primary part of your faith. The fact that he's resurrected today gives all of us hope in the midst of a very desperate world. It is essential. It is true. Here's what it says again. For I delivered to you first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Notice he says this twice. Do you notice that? According to the scriptures. And he was buried in that he is raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He says, don't let go of the fact that this is true and you can stand on this. In fact, he's going to say that in the next verse here. And if it's true, it does change everything. That's the message Paul has for the church at Corinth. If these three things, if these things are true, if Christ was dead, buried, physically buried, physically dead, and resurrected from the grave and in newness of life, bodily, and, and Thomas literally stuck his hand in his side and pushed his hands through, through his fingers, if that's the truth, and that was for our sin, then our sins have been paid for in full, 
And we can come to him openly, honestly, comfortably, knowing that that's paid for. And when the enemy stands before God making accusations of me, he goes, yeah, but for the blood of Christ. And when I come to him, I can come to him in total peace because that's already been paid for. And I don't come in my own merit. I come in the warrant of Christ dying for my sins and paying the price for that. And when he was resurrected from the grave, that part guarantees me newness of life. We're going to talk about that as well this morning. It changes everything. Let me just read you some scripture. See what you think about this. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned back our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed, treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but... He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet, when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Now look at that. Wait a minute. He's buried like a criminal in a rich man's grave, and yet he's going to live a long life and have many descendants, and God will prosper his hands? Seems like a contradiction. Now, even if you've never been in church before, who's this about? It's about Jesus. Everybody agree that's about Jesus? and written 700 years before he was born. The prophecies of the Old Testament God gave us as an evidence, a first evidence I want to talk about today, the first evidence of Christ coming in, what he would be like, where he would be born, who he would be born to, what his ministry would look like, how he would die, what would happen at the the cross, All of those things prophesied in the Old Testament, again, which we'll look at in a moment. The prophecies are one line of evidence. We're only going to talk about two lines of evidence this morning. There are many. But we're going to talk about two lines of evidence that what God tells us in his word about Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection are actually true. And he gave us that beforehand so we know when he got here, this is from God. Perfectly laid out in very specific form. And the interesting thing to me is most of the prophecies concerning Christ he could not affect. Where he would be born, who he would be born to. He he couldn't choreograph that. It's not like he woke up one day and went, I'm gonna I'm gonna put on an act and I'm gonna be the Christ. There were many in in this region that claimed to be the Christ during this time. There are reports, well, reports of over 300 people that claim to be the Christ walking around during Jesus' time. And yet, God knew that would happen, and he knew he was going to have to make a very clear distinction of who Jesus is, so that when he did come, that people would go, yes, that meets prophecy in things that he could never control. 
This is the great Isaiah scroll. It's on display in Israel. And it's in a museum there. It, it, this one dates back to about 150 B.C. The prophecies that would come. All written by Isaiah, one of the prophets, and other prophets. But here's the great Isaiah scroll. And what would happen? Well, the originals, this one was actually dug out of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That, those caves in, in Qumran, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's put on display there, and it's almost 100% intact. Just an amazing evidence. All the predictions concerning Messiah right there in Israel, in the heart of Judaism. Here are just a hand, several handfuls of text about messianic prophecy, prophesying Christ in very precise ways. Let's just look at a couple of them. Here's Micah in 700 B.C. that says Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Now it's interesting because eventually there's two Bethlehems, but it goes on to be very specific. It says Bethlehem of Rapha. That's the Bethlehem he will be born in. Not Rome, not Jerusalem, not these big cities where you expect royalty to come from. He's going to be born in this little podunk Bethlehem of Rapha, Redway kind of town. That's where he's going to be born. I don't think Jesus could affect that very easily. But what about this one, Isaiah 9, 750 B.C. Messiah will be first appear in Galilee, born in Bethlehem, but he will first appear in Galilee in his ministry. He, that's happened and unfolded perfectly. 750 B.C., 750 years before Christ. Typology prefigures delivered, deliverer coming out of Egypt. Now, born in Bethlehem, first in Galilee, then he's going to come out of Egypt down in Africa? How is that ever going to happen? And yet it unfolds in Christ's life perfectly before he's even 12 years old. And then at 1044 B.C., Psalm 22, Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. Go back and read Psalm 22. A thousand years before Christ, his hands and feet will be pierced. And this is written, think about this, this is written 700 years before crucifixion ever even existed. Why would they write his hands and feet will be pierced and there was no such thing as crucifixion in that time? A couple more. Messiah's enemies would throw dice for his clothes in Psalm 22. Again, a thousand years before Christ, a thousand years before crucifixion existed. They were going to throw dice for his clothes. 500 years before, in Daniel 9, accurately predicts the, the exact date of Messiah's death. He'll come, and then this will be when he dies. This will be how he dies, Psalm 22. His hands and feet will be pierced. They'll throw dice for his clothes. God's unfolding a package of prophecies that go, this is true, it is critical to your faith, and if, you, if you're a believer, you're going to understand these are evidences for the resurrection of Christ being true and real and applicable to your life in 2022. Most of these were completed outside of Jesus' control. The pieces of the puzzle that fit perfectly, and there's only one piece that fits that whole in all of human history, and it is the person of Jesus Christ. No other person in all of human history fits those prophecies. 1 Corinthians 15, let's go on. The second line of evidence are eyewitness testimony. Now let me just say this. We record history primarily as being evidenced by actual first-hand eyewitness testimony. That is the best testimony we can have when we start looking at what is true in history and what is not true in history. We've heard a lot of, in the last 50 years about our people in our culture 
rewriting history. But if you go back and look for eyewitnesses to historical events and their reporting, that is what makes that evidence have merit. If it's not eyewitness testimony, then it's secondhand testimony. It is hearsay. So God's going to give us not just one eyewitness or two eyewitnesses, and not just eyewitnesses that are friends of Jesus. He's going to give us eyewitnesses that are enemies of Jesus, that don't have any dog in the fight except to say the opposite thing, and yet they're reporting the very same thing that the, those that follow Jesus are reporting, and those that follow Jesus are reporting this at the risk of their own lives. And yet they go on and do it. These, these, these same guys, by the way, who are not very brave, who ran from, from a little woman standing at a fire. These same guys are eyewitness to these events. Let me read this text from 15.5. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. Then he appeared later to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remained until now. Now this is another important feature of eyewitness testimony. You can get away with saying there were eyewitnesses at, at our stage 2,000 years later. These people were, were saying this at the time that the eyewitnesses still lived. Because it, what, did he, what did he say? If you don't believe it, go ask the, all these other people that will risk their life to tell you that what I'm telling you is true. And the historians record that these eyewitnesses who were, some of who were enemies of Christ, some of who were skeptics that he was the Messiah, but all agreed, yes, he rose again, yes, he appeared to us, yes, he ate with us. Yes, he let, let us touch him to see who was physically real. He wasn't an illusion. Most of those remain until now, these eyewitnesses, but some have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism for having died. Then he appeared to James. James is an interesting one to name here because James is Jesus' half-brother. James is Jesus' half-brother who all through Jesus' life Thought he, was an, he thought he was a crazy man who kept telling him, well, if you're the Messiah, just go to Jerusalem and tell everybody you're the Messiah. Why don't you just do that? He put Jesus down. He made fun of him. But suddenly at the resurrection, James, the brother of Jesus, who had to have flashbacks and go, you know, I never did see him sin. And then he's raised from the, from the grave. James becomes, becomes a teacher of, of Christianity and a martyr for Christ. Tradition holds that James is thrown down from the pinnacle of the temple down onto the stones and that he didn't die completely and all the Sanhedrin come and stoned him to death, finished the job. And James put his life on the line to stand up for a half-brother that he said he didn't believe all during his life. And he made fun of. He says, last of all, he appeared to me, this is Paul writing, one untimely born, he appeared to me also. One untimely born. Out of time. Out of, out of rhythm with things. He, he was saying, I, I was a persecutor of Christians and, and Christ came to me the enemy of Christ, to give testimony of who he is. Cephas, again, Peter, the twelve, he appeared to over 500 at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appears to James, the half-brother of Jesus, then to the apostles, and last of all, Paul says to me. No one can possibly know, some say, as he stare, stares at the Isaiah scroll, no one can possibly know what really happened so long ago. That's true. But how do we rate historical evidence? By actual eyewitnesses' account that we know are firsthand. To Peter, to James, to over 500, and then he says to Paul also, he says, all of these people 
some of who were enemies of Christ, he appeared to. And they give testimony. Yes, he was here. So what is known to be true to those living then? That's the question of history. What is known to be true when we look back in history to those then? Let me give you a fact about historical evidence. Caesar Augustus lives in this roughly the same time frame. Yet there is, there, there is more evidence, historical first-hand evidence, for just the resurrection of Christ than all of the life of Caesar Augustus. There's more manuscripts, there's more copies of manuscripts, and there's earlier manuscripts of the time frame that, that we're talking about here. More just for the resurrection of Christ than for the entire life of Caesar Augustus. Now, which, if I was to ask the average person on the street, what do you think, do you think Jesus was a real person who actually had an actual physical life? Do you believe that? Do you believe that he's a real person? Or do, do you believe Caesar Augustus lived? Which one do you believe more? What do you think the answer would be? Probably Caesar. Why? Because we, we, we are not told these things. We, we, and I, I, I challenge you to go prove me wrong. There's a great book. There's a great book that I would just highly recommend. Josh McDowell. It's called The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Josh was a guy who was challenged to prove that Jesus was not real. He never was a real person. He never really existed. He never really was the Messiah. He never really was crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected. He set out to prove and all the way through, he wrote the first half of this book when I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And then he said more evidence came out. Archaeological evidence just continues to come forward, come forward, come forward, more scientific evidence. So he wrote the last half of the book just to catch up on what actually had been unfolding. He goes through the evidence for Caesar Augustus' life, and he goes through the evidence just for one event in Jesus' life. Not his whole life, just one event, the resurrection. And he lays them side by side, and he says, see, look at the evidence for Caesar. None of us doubt that Caesar existed or that he lived and what he did in his life. Yet the, the earliest manuscript that reports anything about Julius Caesar was a thousand years after his death. That's the earliest manuscripts we have, a thousand years after his death. We've got this manuscript from, from 1 Corinthians that's within 20 years of Jesus' life and death. And it's copies of manuscripts that were made long ago. Evidence that demands a verdict. Get a copy, put it in your library. And we can know the historicity of events in varying degrees of certainty. Uh, because of testimonies, eyewitness testimonies. Almost all of what we know of history comes from credible eyewitness accounts. If we know something to be true in history, it's because we had eyewitnesses to that event. And we have credible evidence that their, their eyewitness testimony is real, and we have documents to prove that it's real. That's the way we, we judge history. This is for Ger, <laughs> Gerd Ludman. Now, Gerd Ludman is no friend of Christianity. Gerd Ludman is an atheist by his own profession, and he is, he is a, a diametrically opposed to anything in Christianity, yet he's reporting, and I want you to hear his words. He says, the testimony of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, that's the text we're looking at today, is the earliest text in the New Testament to make concrete mention of the death, resurrection, and appearances of the risen Christ. Here Paul uses traditions which are much earlier, period, as 1 Corinthians is usually dated around 50 A.D., he's acknowledging this is 50 A.D., 20 years after the death of Christ. We may note, first, that traditions which he mentions must even be older. In other words, the, the, the history that he's mentioning in 1 Corinthians is even older than that. And that there were those at the time of this writing, 20 years later, that are still alive and go, you don't believe me, go talk to that guy. He was no friend of Jesus, but go talk to him. He witnessed it. That's what they were telling people at the time. Pretty incredible historical facts. These are virtually undisputed by any historians that are credible today. 
Jesus of Nazareth was a historical person. He actually lived. He's not a figment of somebody's imagination. He's not a myth. There's historical evidence that he actually was a real person. He was crucified by Pontius Pilate. That's reported by secular historians that hated Christians as well as Christians, as well as what the Bible tells us. Here's Tacitus. Now, the reason I love the, the annals of, of Tacitus is that Tacitus, Tacitus hates Christians, as you'll get the idea as we read this. He hates Christians, and yet he's going to report here the facts are actually true, but I hate them. So listen to what he says. This is, this is a jewel. They got their name from Christus, who was executed by a Senate procurator. The procurator, Pontius Pilate, in the reign of Tiberius, <coughs> he's laying down historical landmarks here, that checked the pernicious superstition for a short time, but it broke out afresh. Not only in Judea, where the plague arose first, but in Rome itself, where all horrible and shameful things in the world collect and find a home. Obviously, not a friend of Christians, but he's reporting the facts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Lastly, he's not only crucified by Pontius Pilate, and Jesus was an actual historical figure, but shortly after his death, his disciples had an actual experience that led them to believe and proclaim that he had risen in the face, in the face of certain death if they said those things in front of certain people. Now, you might claim something to be true that you don't really believe if you're in a certain crowd that believes it. But it's very difficult to convince anybody that those who don't believe it will profess it in a crowd that hate Christians. And yet that's what's happening right here. They are willing to lay down their life because they become so convinced that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. E.P. Sanders, he wrote a book called The Historical Figure of Jesus. He says this, that Jesus' followers had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, a fact. What, what the reality was that gave rise to the experience, I do not know exactly. They believed this, they lived it, and they died for it. That, he says, I know. Here is C.F.D. Mole. If you've never read anything of Mole's, you, you should. We've got some things in our library back here from Mole. The coming into existence of the Nazarenes, Christians, a phenomena undeniably attested by the New Testament, rips a great hole in history, a hole that is the size and the shape of the resurrection. What is the secular historian's purpose to stop it up with? What are they going to put in that hole? The birth and rapid rise of the church remain an unsolved enigma for an historian who refuses to take seriously the only explanation offered by the church itself. Christ actually rose Amen. from the grave. Amen. One of our students, Veritas students, is in a place um, in the Ukraine called Odessa. Uh, I got a text from him about three days ago saying the church is standing strong on the resurrection of Christ and we will have an Easter service come Sunday morning. Now, he's, he's standing in the face of death. And they're, they're killing 30,000 churches in the Ukraine. And there's church services going on this morning celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of our students is standing firm and he says, Pastor, I mean, he's a brand new student, just been a student about two months. He says, Pastor, what I've already learned and know 
from, from so much more than I ever did before. He says, I've, I've been a pastor for a long time, but I didn't know Jesus until the last several months. But I'm willing to stand here and die preaching the resurrection if that's what it takes. Now, I, I dare say we Americans don't have that same gumption for the most part. But here's a man I don't know well except by a couple of writings. That's had virtually the same experience that a, that a man named Paul down in Santa Rosa has had. I was teaching him this past Monday on the attributes of God, and we talked about the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and how that fit perfectly with his justice. And we got through with that class, and usually the class breaks up quick and they get noisy and they start going to their next class. It's sort of typical classroom experience. But we got to the end of that class and there was dead silence. And Paul looked up and he said, I'll never worship the same again. I know my Jesus, and I will worship differently now. You're going to hear more from that guy. You're going to hear a lot more from that guy. The resurrection is not just a beautiful metaphor, as the Jesus seminar has said. This statement may be plausible to the modern skeptic that it's just a metaphor, that he's not real. But it's not plausible. It doesn't stand up to historical scrutiny. By those standards, what is recorded of Jesus is incredibly reliable, and we've got to listen to it. So what are, what are the arguments against the resurrection being true? I'm willing to face the arguments against what the resurrection is. These are the best arguments that I can figure at this point. These are the best arguments that Jesus didn't actually raise from the dead. He was not... He was not genuinely resurrected physically. These are what the scholars who stand against Christianity say. They got something called the swoon theory. The swoon theory is this. Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. When they stuck that spear in his side and it, and it bled blood and water, which is evidence of death, that, 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 that's real, we understand that, but he didn't really die. He just fell into a swoon. And they put him in the grave, and somehow in three days without water or food, went a hole in his side and crucified on the cross. After three days, he got up from there, unwrapped himself from the, from the tomb uh, wrappings, and then somehow pushed a, pushed a two and a half ton stone away uphill, not being able to grab the edge of it in his physical condition. And then he left the grave, walked right past the Roman guards and just left the grave. That's the swing theory. That's a, that takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of faith. Here's, here's another one. The disciples stole the body. The disciples stole the body. Here's these, here's these guys who ran away from the cross, ran away from, from a little girl that was sitting around a fire, scared to death, wouldn't, wouldn't claim Christ, and these same guys went and took on a whole legion of Roman trained warriors, these fishermen, and whooped them and rolled the stone away and stole the body. That's pretty hard to believe, too. These, and by the way, the, the punishment for stealing a, a dead body was death. Stoning to death. Slow, horrible death. But they did that. That's what they say. Then there's a hallucination theory. Well, his appearances after the empty tomb was just a hallucination. Well, I mean, people have hallucinations after people die. I mean, I remember when I was a teenager, my dog died, and I, I, I kept seeing him and hearing his dog tags rattle. People have hallucinations. But it's hard to imagine 500 people having exactly the same hallucination at exactly the same time and standing their life on the line to report it. That actually touched him, ate with him, experienced his miracles. That's a mass hallucination theory. Well, one more I'll give you. This is really crazy. Jesus was a twin. The twin did die on the cross. His twin appeared afterwards and claimed to be Jesus, 
No explanation as to what happened to the body and why the tomb was empty, but that's the twin theory. And that's a theory held by this guy named Bart Erdman. Bart Erdman was in Charlotte, North Carolina, when we were in Charlotte, North Carolina. He is a professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And this is what his book says. Suppose Jesus had a twin. Suppose, imagine, just dream this. Just think about this for a minute. Suppose Jesus had a twin brother. Nothing implausible. People do have twins. They do have twins, you know. That's an alternative explanation. But then he goes on to say this. It's highly unlikely. I don't believe it for a moment. But it's more likely than the idea that God raised Jesus from the dead because it doesn't appear, it doesn't appeal to the supernatural. In other words, the twin theory doesn't appeal to the supernatural, and I don't want to appeal to the supernatural. We can't appeal to the supernatural because that would not be real. Let me just say this. There's natural and there's supernatural. To rule either one of those out in making a judgment about what actually happened is pretty crazy because you're saying, I don't believe something because I've discounted this whole area altogether. I'm not going to consider anything in this realm. I'm only going to consider things over here in this realm. But that's what Bart Erdman said. The idea that God raised Jesus from the dead because it doesn't appeal to the supernatural, which historians have no access to. So if I don't have access to something, I can't believe it. Paradigmatic, closed-minded thinking. I'll take a lousy theory that fits with my worldview assumptions over a good theory that challenges them. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Just give me something I can believe under my stipulations. This is a philosophical objection and not a historical objection. I'm asking you to judge objectively, historically, what we have evidence to, and not some philosophical thought process that rules out an entire area and realm of possibility. This is inherently biased thinking, and it's pretty shaky ground to say the least. Acts 26 says this, why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? Why, why does that seem incredible to you? If he spoke the world into existence and he sent his son to die for our sins, why would it be so incredible to you that he would raise him from the dead? Why does that seem so unimaginable? What level of certainty do you have that God cannot exist? Well, let me just say, if you rule out the possibility God raises the dead, what you've done is said, I'm ruling out God. I'm just ruling out God. And I'm not going to consider that there might be actually a God that created all of this. Here's the alternative. At the creation of the, of the universe, we know something called cause and effect, right? There's always, there's always a cause for an effect. So here's, here's how the universe came into being if you, if you don't believe that there is a God. Nothing bumped into something and created everything. That's, that's cause and effect. Nothing bumped into nothing and created everything. This is not a rational argument. It's just a forceful statement of personal bias. But unfortunately, when people are forceful in their statements and they're, they're charismatic, people believe them. Judge things with our objective standards is that's all I'm asking you to think about. Paul is not asking us to exert blind, blind faith. To the contrary, He's actually asking us to do the hard work of thinking. And people don't think because it's hard work. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot just to go, well, I imagine something. But to actually think and do research, that's hard work. It's true. It is an essential of the Christian faith. And here's what it says again in verse 3. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that, that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's saying to the, those in Corinth who are saying there's no resurrection, 
That's just too hard to believe. He says, if Christ was raised, how can you say there's no resurrection? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. It's of no use. It's, it's worthless. It's vanity. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. It's vain faith. Moreover, we, <laughs> moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God. In other words, you can't have this the little bit of Christianity. Go through the smorgasbord at the cafeteria. Well, I'll take, a, I'll take some potatoes. No, no green beans, please. No, the cafeteria is open, but it's all got to be there to be true, to be of any value. Otherwise, your faith, he says, is in vain. Moreover, we have found to be false witnesses of God because we testify against God that he raised Christ. If we say he raised Christ and he didn't, we testify falsely. For he did not raise if, in fact, the dead are not raised. It's pretty easy logic. Don't push your faith in something that's not true. Don't put your faith in anything that's not true. Romans 4.25 says this. He washed, he was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life because to make us right with God, to give us a right relationship with God. Both of those things have to be true. What if I came and told you the story? Jesus went to the cross, he was put in the ground, and he was buried there. End of story. Go home. You, you're wasting your time here this morning. Just go home. The reality of death destroys the hope and makes everything vain if, it's not, if there's no resurrection in Christ. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are all men most to be pitied, he says. Just go home. <coughs> be dismissed. For he didn't raise from the grave, then there is no hope. But he did raise from the grave. And there is hope. And that word hope, biblically, is the word confident expectation. We think of hope as being, well, I wish something would happen. I really wish it would happen. That's my hope, is it's going to happen. No, every time you see the word hope in the Bible, in the Greek, in the New Testament, what you are seeing is a word that to those people in that time meant, I have a confident expectation this is what's happened. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, that's Adam, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For in, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. There's the truth of the resurrection. We failed in Adam very quickly. I want to show you something. This is the first fruit. This time of year, if you're walking through the woods and you see this little shoot come out of the ground, what does that say? It gives you hope that there's something more coming. You don't get excited about that little shoot. You get excited about what's coming as a result of that little shoot. That little shoot is just evidence. The Christ's resurrection is just evidence of the resurrection of us all. He says you will be given new bodies, new bodies in this world. But now in Christ has been raised from the dead, first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man death came into the world, by man also the resurrection from the dead. For in Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. If you are not in Christ... You're not alive. Let me quickly give you a diagram and we'll close out. This is Adam, and that little green dot is you. You are in Adam. You are in his loins, so to speak. He is, he is the forefather of all of us. And he has a perfect relationship with God up there in the Trinity. He has that perfect relationship with God in the garden. But then something happens and he sins and he breaks that relationship. It's severed. 
He gets a sin nature that's passed on to us. He's alienated from God. He has guilt and judgment. He has unmet needs that were being totally met before, and he suffers death. None of that was real before he chose to sin. And we're in Adam. But the promise is that in Jesus Christ, we are restored in that relationship. We have been adopted by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're adopted into his family. We are made righteous, not that we are righteous, but that we come before him. I come before God in my sin, and he looks at me through the blood of Christ, and he says, righteous. The Holy Spirit indwells us, and there is eternal life to look forward to. That's the story of the resurrection. That's the gospel. Paul gives the gospel to them again, and he says, no, no, no. Don't you give up the resurrection. For here's the gospel. You're a sinner. Christ took on your sin. He became sin for you. He died on the cross for your sin. And when he died on the cross for your sin and that blood was spilt, it was paid in full. No debt left. And when he was resurrected, he was the first fruit of the resurrection that is to come. That is when all of us are with him in new bodies, thank God. Verse 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? He says, you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. He's appealing to that farmer mentality. You put that seed in the ground, it's a dead seed. That's what comes back to life. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else, but God gives it a body just as he wished. And to each of the seeds of the body of its own. The opposite of living a vain life is one of living a life of genuine hope. He says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. There's that word steadfast. Stand fast. Firm, another translation says. Stand firm, immovable, always abounding in the work of our Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in our Lord. It's what the Bible calls hope. The resurrection is true, and it is an essential of the Christian faith. If you believe that, that one day you will be resurrected and be in heaven with him in a new body, it is essential to the Christian faith because that's what a Christians believe. If you don't believe that, then you're not a Christian yet. And it changes everything. And when, and when Paul down in Santa Rosa looked at me the other day, that's what he said, this changes everything. I'll never worship the same again for I understand more about who my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. It changes everything. Let's pray.